Out in my garage, I have a rack that is quite literally full of servers. And the number one question that I get in the comments is, what do I actually use all of those for? Mostly, my home lab is for experimentation, be it with different configurations for file storage or virtualization, or getting into some more complex services like VDI with my cloud gaming server. Okay, but what are some practical uses for that much hardware? Today, I'm gonna to show you how to download your entire games library and play them from your gaming PC with all the files hosted on a network storage server. Best of all, there's no funny network configuration or applications refusing to work, as your PC will see this as just another local hard drive. So sit back, relax, grab a beer, and let's get started. Today's video is brought to you by Anchor and the Nano Pro 20 watt USB-C charger. The only thing worse than forgetting to charge your phone is realizing it'll take hours with the adapter that came with it. The Nano Pro features Power IQ 3, Anchor's universally compatible quick charge technology, so you can power up your devices and move on with your day. With more and more phones opting to not include a charger, you're free to choose one that works for you and all of your devices. Go from a stone cold phone to 50% battery in as little as 26 minutes. And at half the size of a standard iPhone 20 watt charger, the Nano Pro is easy to travel with and save space when plugged into an outlet. Plus, with Anchor's Active Shield safety technology, power output and temperature are continuously monitored to protect your connected devices. Check out the Anchor Nano Pro by following the link down in the video description. Charge it fast, make it last, and thanks to Anchor for sponsoring today's video. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. Out in my server rack, I have well over 100 terabytes of usable space, and only about half of it is currently being used. Meanwhile, the SSDs on my desktops are constantly running out of space, meaning I have to keep buying SSDs, knowing full well I have about 50 terabytes free just about 50 feet away from me. That is exactly the problem we're going to try and solve today, utilizing the storage in my network rack and allowing my desktops to see it as if it were just another local storage disk, but with all the benefits that ZFS and TrueNAS bring to the table. While solid state drives continue to get cheaper and cheaper, hard drives do still rule the roost when it comes to capacity per dollar, especially when you look into used enterprise disks. And throw enough spinning drives together, you'd actually be surprised at the speed you can get out of them compared to SSDs. Now obviously, we're not talking 8,000 megabytes per second like you'd expect from a top of the line Gen 4 NVMe drive, but I have seen one gigabyte per second with low latency out of an array of spinning rust, starting to push the limits of the network between you and your server. Now the reason I have so much storage is mainly due to editing these videos that you all continue to watch, but there is a lot more on my TrueNAS server than just video of me swearing at getting a line wrong for the ninth time in a row. As much as I love having physical media, I have my entire DVD and Blu-ray collection ripped onto Plex, consuming nearly 7 terabytes on its own. I also have copies of most physical software media I've collected over the years, taking up another couple terabytes in their own right. But while I'm using nearly 50 terabytes of space on my server, that leaves another 50 terabytes free for the taking. And while these videos I make aren't getting any smaller, neither are the Call of Duties, Hitmans, or Flight Simulators of the world. Now, if you're like me, I'm sure you have tried creating a Windows share on your file server and hosting your Steam library as a mapped network drive. While this does work sometimes, you'll actually run into limitations both with the file system used as well as how Windows handles network attached storage. Most Windows shares from Linux based servers are actually running either EXT or ZFS file systems, which differ greatly from Windows NTFS. The long explanation is much too boring to get into here, but the short version is Windows games and applications expect to be able to read and write data in a very specific way, and don't like it when things don't work the way it expects. Windows network shares are hosted using the SMB protocol, often referred to as Samba, and Windows does not look at this the same way that it does a local disk. While any file stored on your local drive is accessed via the drive letter and the file path, for example, C, Program Files, Steam, SMB shares are just a little different. While an SMB share can be accessed via its mounted drive letter, more often than not by Windows it's addressed via its UNC path. So instead of Z Steam library, it would be seen from Windows as TrueNAS Server Craft NX 71205 slash Steam library. This confuses and angers most Windows applications, resulting in a ton of bugs, crashes, or in some cases even a refusal to work at all. 
Luckily, there is a way to view network storage as just another disk on your local PC, and it's through a protocol known as iSCSI. Instead of using network sharing protocols and foreign file systems, iSCSI lets you share a block of storage from a network file server, and format it using a native file system like NTFS in Windows or APFS in Mac. Best of all, you can also take advantage of your file server's features when it comes to disk management, like snapshots or even deduplication in ZFS. There's also less overhead on both the host and client system when using iSCSI versus traditional network storage. Since my home file servers are all running TrueNAS, that's what I'm going to be configuring today as the host. But iSCSI is an open protocol and has hosting and client options available for just about every OS and hardware spec you can imagine. So think of this more as an introduction to the technology rather than the be all end all guide. There is one downside to iSCSI that I haven't mentioned yet, and it may be a deal breaker for some, which is why I'm giving you it before the tutorial. And that's that iSCSI is meant to be accessed by a single client PC only. Think of an iSCSI drive as just another drive plugged into your PC. If I were to take that hard drive out and put it into another PC, none of your permissions or settings will carry over. Using iSCSI, you're not going to be able to host a single Steam library on a file server and then share that file out to every computer on your network. Each client will still need its own iSCSI drive configured and will need to download their games library on their own. Now, there is a way to save space and only keep a single copy of the data when you've actually downloaded two separate copies of the game into two separate iSCSI drives. But deduplication is a subject for another time, so make sure you subscribe so you don't miss that one. With all that out of the way, let's get your new iSCSI drive set up and running. The server for today's video is going to be the HP DL80 Gen 9 that I reviewed just a couple of months ago. And if you want to check out the hardware in that video, you can click right up here. The long and short of it is, it has 20 cores and 40 threads on two E5 2660 V3 CPUs and 64 gigabytes of DDR4 memory. As for the hard drives, I installed all of my Seagate Constellation ES2 3 terabyte drives into here, so I have 12 of them in total, however I'm only going to be setting up an array with 4 of those disks for today's video. To start out, go ahead and open up your TrueNAS server, head over to your Storage tab, and then go down to Pools. Now I'm assuming if you're adding this to an existing TrueNAS server, you already have your pools set up. If not, I also have a tutorial for installing TrueNAS, and again, you can click right up there. Find the storage pool you want to add your iSCSI disk to. I'm going to go to the three dot menu over to the right hand side, and I'm going to say add ZVOL. Give your ZVOL a name. In this case, I'm going to name mine Steam-Library. Under size for the ZVOL, you need to define what the maximum space you're going to allow to this volume will be. And in my case, I'm going to say three terabytes. Now note, this won't actually consume three terabytes of data right now. This is just the max size the volume can grow to. Under compression level, I'm going to select LZ4, and then I'm going to check the sparse box right here, and that will allow the volume to grow into the maximum size. And if everything looks good, go ahead and click on Submit. Next, we'll need to set up the iSCSI share itself, and that is very simple to do. Go down to the Sharing tab and click on Block Share, and then in parentheses, iSCSI. The easiest way to configure an iSCSI share is using the built-in wizard, which you can find right up here in the top right of the window. So go ahead and click on the wizard button. Under name, I'm going to name this again Steam-Library. Under extent type, select device, and then the device we want is the Steam Library ZVOL that we just set up. Under sharing platform, I prefer to go with modern OS with 4 kilobyte block sizes. Go ahead and click on next. Under Portal, we're going to select the network interface that TrueNAS listens for iSCSI connections on. So click on Portal and go down to Create New. Under the IP address dropdown, go ahead and select the quad zeros, which will allow TrueNAS to listen on any network device. And just leave the port settings at 3260, which is the default iSCSI port. And go ahead and click on Next. Under Initiator, you'll set up which clients are allowed to connect to the iSCSI share, either via hostname, via IP address, or even a range of IP addresses. By leaving this blank, TrueNAS will let any client connect. As this is only a games library, I'm leaving security pretty lax here, but do take care to lock this down if you're hosting any files of consequence. And if everything looks good, go ahead and click on Next, and then click on Submit. And finally, the last thing to do is actually enable the iSCSI service, and that is done by scrolling down to the Services tab, clicking on that, scrolling down to iSCSI, and enable the service. You'll also want to check the box that says Start Automatically, so the share starts up when the server starts up. And with that done, we can move on over to the PC side of the setup. 
For this demo, I'm going to show off connecting to Windows 10, but again, iSCSI is an open protocol, so any PC in the last 20 years is likely able to connect with no issues. If you need instructions for your particular OS, Google is going to be your friend here. Under Windows, the application we need is baked into most installs, and it is called the iSCSI Initiator. So I'm going to type in iSCSI, iSCSI Initiator. And iSCSI does require a service to be running, and the first time you run the initiator, it will ask you if you would like the service to start every single time. So I'm going to click on yes. Since we set up our target with non-authenticated access, all we have to do is type in the target IP address. So in this case, it is 10.0.0.162, and I'm going to say quick connect. Right there, we can see our Steam library iSCSI drive, and I'm going to click on done. Now that the Steam library is connected, we're pretty much good to go, except we're not. As you'll notice, under my PC, there's no hard drive showing up here yet. And that's because all we've done is connect to the block storage of our network share. We actually haven't defined what a partition or a file system is for this system yet. So let's go ahead and do that now. To do that, you'll want to head on down to the Start menu and search for Disk Management. And Windows lets us know that we have a new disk installed that is ready to initialize. So we're going to go ahead and give that a GPT partition table. Click OK. And right here, you can see a blank 3 terabyte drive. I'm going to right click on that, go to New Simple Volume, click on Next, then Next again to accept the default size. And this will get a default drive letter of E, and that works just fine for me. I'm going to click on Next, and we're going to format this with NTFS, and I'm going to give it a volume name of Steam Library and click on Next and Finish. And just as easy as that, we have a brand new drive now showing up under my PC. Here's our E drive called Steam Library with a usable three terabytes of space on board. And the best thing of all, this is showing up as a local disk, not a network share. For those interested, this is how a network share normally shows up under Windows. You can see that even though this does have a drive letter of Z, it shows up as a network location instead of a local drive. The problem with that, again, is how Windows addresses files that are on that disk. One potential downside to this configuration is going to be speed, as instead of connecting to storage over a PCI Express interface that's capable of thousands of megabytes per second, you're connecting over network, so you have to work within those limitations. If you have a 10 gigabit connection to your local network, that can easily achieve speeds about twice as fast as a SATA SSD, or around 940 megabytes per second. However, on 1 gigabit, you'll have a max throughput of around 92 megabytes per second. Now, that may not sound great, but keep in mind, if you're still running your games library off of a spinning drive on your local PC, you're likely not going to notice a difference anyway, as most spinning drives struggle to hit over 100 megabytes per second transfer speeds. But let's go ahead and test what kind of speeds we'll see over a 1 gigabit and 10 gigabit connection. So I'm running Crystal Disk Mark on my Z drive, and you can see we're maxing out at around 88 megabytes per second in read speeds. And there we go, we got 88 and 141 megabytes per second read and write respectively, with our 4K non-sequential coming in at pretty good scores as well, at 57 and 60. As you can see, the jump to 10 gigabit is where things start to really get fun, as we can finally take advantage of some of those high-end ZFS features, like the fact that it reads and writes all of its data directly from RAM. So our speeds are well and above faster what four spinning drives should be capable of, at 971 megabytes per second read and 1130 megabytes per second right. So we have the drive set up, but how do you actually store your games on it? Well, again, it's as simple as using this as a local drive. So inside of Steam, we're going to go to System Settings, go down to Downloads, and then click on Steam Library Folders. This will open a window that looks kind of like this, and you can see the little plus sign right there. Go ahead and click on that. I'm going to select the E drive, which is our Steam Library. I'm going to say New Folder and call it Steam Library, and then hit Select. With that set up, if I go to my Steam Library tab and go to the Settings cog, I can set this to my default folder. With that selected as the default folder, anytime I go to install a game on Steam, it will automatically install it onto my E drive, which is my iSCSI Steam Library. Now, just as a reminder, if you want to set up multiple iSCSI drives, you certainly can, but each system will have to have its own iSCSI connection and its own ZVol setup on TrueNAS. Now, you're not going to be able to share your game's library, as in a single folder, with multiple systems at the same time. However, each system can have their own ZVol and their own iSCSI connection and save their own game's library inside of TrueNAS. 
But again, there is a way to save on space if you have multiple copies of the same game on multiple iSCSI drives, and that is through ZFS deduplication. And that's going to be the subject of an upcoming video. So make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss that one. If you liked this one, you know what to do. Hit that thumbs up button and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on Twitter at Craft Computing to keep up with daily shenanigans like this. And if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, head on over to craftcomputing.store, grab yourself a pint glass, hoodie, or t-shirt. Thank you all so much for watching this one, and as always, I will see you in the next video. I don't know why I'm clinking glasses with this one, because that was awful. Cheers, guys. Beer for today is going to catch some of you off guard. It is from 49th State Brewing up in Alaska. It is the Thundershuck Oyster Pale Ale. Now, oyster stouts are a thing, and they are exactly what you think they are. They are a stout that is made with oysters. So this is a pale ale that's made with oysters. Thank you, Alaska. Now, I've had a number of oyster stouts in my day, but I cannot think of a time that I have had an oyster IPA. So here goes nothing. So this did get a little bit of a head on it, but then it died down very quickly. And what's left is just like a single layer of bubbles across the top of the beer. Uh, this is definitely not clear, uh, but it's also not opaque. This is not like a hazy in appearance. You can see through it, it's just a little bit murky. Which, when I think of seafood, I always equate murky with a sign of quality. Well now, that is certainly a beer. <laughs> you know, on the nose, I'm getting kind of a traditional Northwest hop profile. Think like Cascade, Willamette, or Chinook hops. You know, quintessential Oregon and Washington-based hops. There's nothing really off-putting about this at all. And until you start to drink it. Super, super, super dry. Like, think lemons and salt water dry. Uh, now, the brininess, the, the saltiness of this drink is really no surprise, seeing as how it is made with oysters. But, whew, that is not a flavor that's gonna work for everyone. I don't even know that it works for me. Oysters may not seem like the most logical ingredient for a beer. They do work inside stouts, especially when you get like a thick imperial stout, like something in the 11.5 or higher range. Those are typically stouts that need a little bit of balance to counteract the sweetness and the roastiness of the dark malt. And so you add a little bit of salt and what you're left with is a very pleasant drink. Think something in the line of salted caramel. But with an IPA that is already sitting on the bitter side of things, especially with some Northwest hops that are very vegetal, very plant-like in their, their flavor profile, adding salt and a little bit of lemon to the top of that, boy, I just don't know that it works that well. I'm still going to drink it, but I don't have to be happy about it. Oh, oh. Do not take a big drink of this one. I'm gonna need to go get some water. <laughs> a little bit extra here. That salt now is sitting right at the top of my throat and it's making me like want to cough and sneeze all at the same time. If this were an oyster stout, I'd probably be enjoying it. Nope, nope. Don't like this.